from the 16th to the 19th century, and is particularly interested in scientific institutions and policies, teaching and education, and the social and economic role of quantification. Uh, Thomas, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so thank you very much for, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for, for having me here. I hope that you can all um, hear me. I'll try to um, begin, to, to keep it uh, in time. Uh, and I will share my uh, screen. I hope that it's um, that it's working. Thomas, uh, let, let me just say I forgot uh, the people who are uh, attending this session. I mm -hmm. see we have a, a good audience right now. Uh, please write your questions in the key Q&A and we are going to have questions at the end of the three papers. Thank you. Go ahead, Thomas. Okay, um, so um, I will talk about the future of history of science and technology from um, a French perspective, talking about the past and hopefully a bit about the, the future. And the simple fact that the title and the talks are all in English um, is already something for the French humanities because we have a tradition of doing things mainly in French, more than that in one uh, second, but it's gradually uh, changing. Um, also telling is the fact that despite talking for France and being French, I'm currently working in um, Germany, in Wuppertal, as, as you said. So here again, the traditional French isolationism is maybe giving way to more European or even global um, perspective. Um, I'm afraid that the talk might be a slightly boring and a bit institutional, uh, and I'll try to uh, draw on my experience as uh, president of the French uh, Society for the History of Science and Technology, the Société Française d'Histoire des Sciences et des Techniques, and trying to talk a bit about the French ecosystem and uh, its past and future. Um, but I hope that beyond the French case, this might be interesting to see France as an example of like a medium-sized country, like for instance, Germany or Italy, uh, all of those have a rich tradition in the history of science and technology, taking like uh, decades, an active community, a language that was once dominant and is still used, for instance, for PhD thesis, uh, but uh, countries that are facing maybe disciplinary and institutional challenges. Um, there will be three parts because obviously there are always three parts when French people give talks. Uh, the first will be about um, the language, a very important thing for us. The second will be about institutions. And in the last one, I will try to, um, to mention maybe two very quickly, two small um, examples of what uh, kind of things are, are done uh, nowadays in, in the French um, academia. Um, so first part, beyond the monopoly of English, French, in and beyond uh, France. The question of language from a French um, perspective is, um, is an important and a healthy debated um, topic. You probably know that, but just to give you a few, um, a few facts, in the last Congress of the French Société d'Histoire des Sciences, a few months ago, there was a debate that was entitled Publié en anglais, so published in English, and the simple fact that the debate was organized uh, and that the title was not a statement but was a question is revealing of how loaded and complicated the, the topic is. We have a French mailing list and for instance uh, if one writes in English you always have someone who comes and, and complains about, about that. Um, and there are reasons for that. After all, a huge number of books very influential have been published in French uh, over the years. Uh, you have lots of primary sources in French. Uh, which is also a common feature with um, Italian, German, or Spanish, for instance. And uh, many people do speak French. Uh, in fact, during this last Congress, uh, Simon Schaeffer, despite being one of the most famous British history of science, gave his talks about facts and hearsay in the Enlightenment in a brilliant French and uh, answers the questions also in, in uh, French. Uh, that being said, uh, I think it's interesting to see the debate about language in 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 less mannequin way, um, because the, the, all the talks about decline or switching to English are not that new. Uh, if, for instance, we have um, a look at a very famous book um, and a very famous uh, person, Alexandre Coiré, 
he shows how the switch between English and French has always been there in a way. In 1957, his book, uh, From the Closed World to the Infinite Universe, was published in um, English in Baltimore. And only five years later was it translated in French in the Presse Universitaire de France. The same could be said, obviously, about uh, Latour and Woolgar's uh, Laboratory Life, which was only translated into French like 10 years afterwards, and with postscript in which uh, they discuss what it means when British and French people write uh, together about um, science. Uh, maybe more relevant for the future of the history of science and technology is the fact that French continues to be a relevant academic language for a wide community of researchers. Obviously, we can think of Belgium, Switzerland, Quebec, and many countries where French serve as an official language, but also all kinds of other countries, Italy, Germany, Japan, uh, where people are working on subjects uh, with lots of French sources. If you're working on the Encyclopédie of the 18th century, there are good chances that you will have to speak and write French. Um, with this idea in mind, the um, French Society for the History of Science and Technology has in recent years clarified its policy regarding our thesis prize, for instance. Uh, no, we have clarified it's not about being French, it's about writing in, in French. And so any work written in French can apply for the prize. Um, so that includes the broad community of uh, people who write their PhD in French for any kind of uh, reason. And if we look at the last three winners, uh, we have someone uh, from Italy, we have someone from Canada, and um, the last uh, person was French, but writing a French dissertation about China and the global history of knowledge. So we see that there are benefits for these kind of uh, things. It's not an accident, and I think that it fits larger trends about the continuous use of French in the history of science community. It is a minor language, but it's still highly relevant in some areas. Important colleagues from the Italian, German, and English-speaking world have published seminal papers in uh, French. Here, just two examples. You can see Otto Zibums and Simon Schaeffer's uh, articles, Les Gestes de la Mesure and Les Cérémonies de la Mesure, both published in Anal Histoire Sans Social, a, a big French um, uh, journal uh, edited, that's maybe a bit ironic, by Cambridge University Press. So is everything all right with the French language? This might be slightly um, optimistic. An important issue is the still relatively low level of, it, of English teaching, especially in universities. I'm not sure that many French students nowadays working on Coire's closed world are using the English original. They probably use the French translation. And you have a larger problem. Uh, which is that the publishing business um, of books and journals is very capital intensive and you have few uh, French presses, maybe the Presse Universitaire de Renanson, that are willing to develop strong series in the history of science and um, technology. You can also see that there are, for instance, not that many source books published, something that in the English speaking world is very common and we lack this kind of uh, things. You have important French journals. You have the Revue d'Histoire des Sciences, the Cahier François Villette, or the Revue d'Histoire des Mathématiques. All of them no accept papers in English and publish mostly in French. This combination um, can seem obvious, but it's not the case. If you look at Germany, for instance, the Berichte zur Wissenschaftsgeschichte, no, uh, it's a German journal publishing mostly in English. So it, it's not that easy to find, to find a balance. Um, and a uh, last thing that we might mention, speaking about that, is that Centaurus, uh, despite being the official journal of the European Society for the History of Science, only publishes papers in one English, in one language, which is English. So you have reasons for that, but um, it's a bit uh, it's a bit unfortunate. So let us now turn to the uh, second point: uh, the labyrinths of French institution. I will try to be more. Yeah, to be, to be that quickly, uh, because people find institution boring. Um, but I think it should be uh, important for foreigners to get a sense of the French landscape, and maybe more important for the French to understand how complicated our system is seen from um, outside. You have a, a pretty um, solid um, master's and PhD programs in the history of science and, and technology. 
Um, which might explain why we have a high number of uh, PhD students writing their PhDs in the history of, uh, of science, but things get weird uh, at the stage of early career positions. We have a system that's traditionally based on a close link between schools and universities, um, but it's quite outdated and we don't really have like even a middle belt system like the Germans, which has its own flows, but you have a big gap between defending one's PhD and stable position. You basically have yearly contracts and highly unstable. It's not uncommon in the world, but still it should be a mention. And, um, um, and finally, you have... Um, uh, you have a panorama of French institutions that are quite convoluted. If you're a foreigner, you probably do not know the difference between applying for um, a university, for the EHSS, for the EPHE, for the CNRS, uh, and neither do I, honestly. Um, so it might give the impression that the system is not very welcoming for foreigners, uh, and the use of French exclusively at all the stage of hiring process might also be a problem for the integration of colleagues from other countries, which should probably be a goal for for um for everyone so maybe just to conclude with two very um short uh, examples for a french perspective in the history of science and technology um i might uh, underline the history of mathematics is probably the largest subdiscipline in in the field and i'm not saying that because i'm historian of mathematics but you have lots uh, of french colleagues working in in um, this field for many reasons, because mathematics is very important in France and because you have lots of positions. Um, and it's important to note that um, they have produced classics that have been translated into English, for instance, Alain de Rosier, Politics of Large Numbers, a classic, or Highways and Byways by Jean Pfeiffer and Ami Dahan. Uh, and um, this also means not only that there are many colleagues, but also uh, that you have uh, a very uh, large breadth of themes and time periods. You have specialists of all kinds uh, of regions, Southeast Asia, uh, China, um, Mesopotamia, up to 20th century mathematics with uh, studies on, on Bobaki and so on. Uh, and that is quite remarkable. Also, the interconnection with uh, the rest of, um, of, uh, of the, the world. You have many collaboration between friends and, and other groups. And maybe a, a similar point can be made about the history of, of knowledge. That's another interesting um, area. It has received a great deal of attention recently. Should knowledge as category replace science and technology, these kind of, of things. And these new studies have not only originated in North America or in England, but also in Scandinavia, in Germany with the Wissensgeschichte and in France with the Histoire des, des Savoirs. I won't write, uh, I won't discuss specifically the French situation. You have a very good article by Stéphane Van Damme on that, on Histoire des Savoirs and History of Knowledge in, in France. But I would just like to underline that it, this example shows very well how the French academia has its specificities, but fits within larger trends. For instance, the intellectual history of technology, a strong point in France, has very gracefully embraced this history of knowledge. The history of ecology, for instance, also, and here is an example with place and, and milieu of, of knowledge, for instance. And this synthesis between larger trends and uh, a local uh, French-speaking uh, academia has produced very interesting results. Um, in conclusion, I, I don't have a general conclusion, maybe just note that the French case is interesting both for itself and also because it shows an example of that probably many other countries have, uh, at least European countries, trying to adapt their uh, old model to new new condition, and that might be maybe the object of the discussion. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Thomas, um, and for keeping the time. Uh, I remind the people that are attending that please uh, write down your notes and please in the Q and A indicate to, to, to whom you're proposing the question. Now we are having uh, Raul, Raul Necoche Lopez, 
He, he works on the University of North Carolina. He has done previously his PhD in history from the McGill University and held the postdoctoral at the university uh, the fellowship at the University of Toronto. And he is broadly interested in the history of medicine, science, sexual and reproductive health uh, in, in Latin America. He is particularly interested in non-US voices and sources to bear on health and medical research in the US. He is now the president of the Peruvian Society for the History of Science, Technology and Health. Uh, hold the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Luisa. I am going to share my screen next. Um, oh, there. And I hope everybody can see my slides okay. Great, thank you. Well, it is a pleasure to be here. Many thanks to the organizers of this global festival, uh, Lisbeth de Moll, Tomas Haddad, and Sam Robinson. Also to our chair, Luisa Sosa, our, our tech host, Alexander Stoger. Um, as Luisa said, my name is Raul Necochea Lopez. I'm a historian and I am based at the University of North Carolina. I live in the city of Chapel Hill, which is a, uh, it's not so small. It's a university town in the center of the state of North Carolina. Uh, I can't assume who knows much about the geography of the Eastern United States, but it's kind of in the middle of the Eastern United States on the coast, um, except my town is not on the coast. It's inland, about three hours in. I have been here about 13 years. I am originally from Peru. As Tomas was saying, you know, we move. Uh, he is a, he's a French specialist, but he's now in Germany. I, I'm a I'm a Peruvian, a Peruvianist, but now I'm a migrant and in the United States. Um, I'm based at the School of Medicine here. And so my day-to-day -day life consists of training aspiring physicians in the social sciences and humanities disciplines. And I also have my own research program. As Luisa said, I'm very keen on history of uh, health and history of science and medicine. I've written a lot about um, sexual and reproductive health. Um, and I'm currently working on a couple of books. Uh, one is an edited collection about the global history of the concept of reproductive justice. And the other one is a history of HPV related cancers in the Andean region, which covers Ecuador, Colombia, Peru, Bolivia, and Chile. And the main thing that I wanted to bring to your attention today is, is this organization, uh, the Asociación Peruana de Historia y Estudios Sociales de la Ciencia, la Tecnología y la Salud, uh, represented by the Quinchona tree, the Quina tree, first uh, global treatment for malaria that was found in the Americas. Um, I'm going to refer to it as the Asociación. I know we need a shorter name. We haven't really landed on a good option for that. Um, I believe the, the, the association plays a singular role in the future of storytelling about science, technology, and health in, in my country. Uh, for full disclosure, I should say that I just stepped down as, as president, uh, and, and so I, I might be biased, but, but I, I really believe it, it, it could play a very important role in the country. Uh, scholarship on science, technology, and health in Peru has been fragmented and underpowered. There are very few researchers who can dedicate themselves professionally to this type of work. Um, in a way, it is symptomatic of, of research careers in Latin America more broadly. Um, they're underfunded and underappreciated. And most colleagues do find time to do this in, in Peru as amateurs, and, and few have ways to connect with each other. A group of about 20 scholars and students founded the Asociación in 2018. Um, Barbara Kirsi was there at the revolution. Um, so she can maybe tell you her own perspective on how that struck her. Um, our goals when we came together was number one, to overcome our own fragmentation uh, through meetings and publications, to promote the research of Peruvianists on science, technology, and health wherever we are, and uh, three, to help preserve sources and archives related to topics that interest us. We are all volunteers, uh, the officers and the members of the council. Uh, we have one part-time paid communication staffer who looks after our internet presence. Uh, and therein lies one of our uh, ongoing challenges. You know, we all wear many hats and taking charge of a fledgling organization such as this one is quite a task. It, it includes persuading people um, to participate, pay our modest, they're really modest, uh, modest dues, and find activities that have both flash but also substance. Um, 
And speaking of those things, uh, we have a workshop that happens every two years, more or less. Uh, we have had four so far. Um, they started off as in-person, uh, but the pandemic taught us that we could do this just as well in, in virtually and, and, and in hybrid uh, ways. And that's include more colleagues else in, in various parts of Peru and, and the globe. They are typically two-day workshops with about 15 people presenting, about twice or three times as many people in the audience. Uh, we usually have enough of a budget to, you know, treat us to lunch and more um, just to keep us going through those two days. Um, I will show you a bit of the, uh, well, the logo for the program in, 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 in a moment. We also naturally, we, we promote scholarship. Our first collective book is on the way. It's made of papers that were presented during our 2021 workshop, and it is being lovingly edited by our colleague Patricia Palma, who is at the Universidad de Tarapacá in Chile. Uh, and it features the work of young historians who have recently completed uh, doctoral thesis and master's thesis also. It consists of nine chapters, which um, cluster around three major themes, which are somewhat representative of where the, the, this, this multidisciplinary group is, is headed. Um, the first consists of interpretations of illness by clinicians, including especially mental health. The second one concerns public health and sanitation infrastructures and their growth and development. And three, uh, engineering knowledge acquired and deployed through major public works. Uh, the book covers a substantial period from the 18th century to about the 1960s. Funding for academic publications is scarce. This is something that Tomas also uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and this is why this book is going to be an ebook. Uh, they ebooks, e as you know, they, they considerably reduce publishing costs, making it possible for readers to access this particular collection free of charge. Our major partner in this adventure is the Instituto Rivaguero, which is the Humanities Research Center of the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Perú. Uh, it is important to keep on cultivating this kind of relationship with established institutions to assure readers of the rigor of the scholarship that we are uh, uh, sponsoring. <clears throat> and also because they, they, they are uh, as, as an established institution that has a, a lot of experience with um, e publishing platforms, <clears throat> and we don't. Uh, it's also important to note that there have been some significant changes in the Asociación in just five years. Uh, we were originally a group of historians, but pretty much on day one, we realized the strength of numbers and deliberately included uh, sociologists, anthropologists, engineers, public health specialists, physicians, and archivists librarians in, in, from the get-go. In 2021, we you know, just had to recognize that the name didn't really do justice to the breadth of, of people that we included. So we changed our name to the far longer name that you see at the top of your screen. Um, our board of advisors reflects also this, this disciplinary diversity and also the need to include colleagues who, whose day-to-day -day work is not in universities or research institutes, but who also work in government agencies, including the Peruvian National Council of, of, on Science and Technology, uh, or CONCITEC. Um, so top part is part of the poster for the last, um, oh man, it got cropped in a, in a less than ideal way. Um, it's, it's, part of the, it's part of the poster. Sorry, I'm looking at the chat. Thank you for the five minute warning, Luisa. Um, we are very proud of our online presence and followers who keep up with what we do. It's a small organization, I think, that punches above its weight, but we still have challenges getting colleagues to do more than comment and uh, give us suggestions. Uh, what we need is for people to be willing to uh, volunteer their labor for free. <laughs> Perhaps I shouldn't be surprised that recruiting to work for the council and as an officer has been difficult. I mean, that, that said, I, I just stepped down because uh, my turn concluded and we have a new president who is Dr. Ruth Guini, who's a social scientist at the School of Public Health at the Cayetano Heredia University. And at the workshop, when I stepped down and she took over, we had another successful group of several presentations that clustered around four themes, again, spanning 18th through the 20th centuries. Um, ideas about climate and health, uh, again, the publication of engineering knowledge, 
the professional education of health workers and the preservation and promotion of relatively underused archives. I'm especially pleased um, that we were able to attract colleagues who are based in Puto in the northern coast, in San Martin, which is in the central Amazon region, and in Moquegua in southern Peru. Our colleague Pedro Peralta, who was representing the latter, was discussing collections available in three southern locales, in Arequipa, Moquegua, and Tacna. And I think this is one of the most important things that we can do as a professional organization, to bring attention to underused archives. Um, and oopsie. last, I think there's several uh, important directions for the future of storytelling in, 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 in this area in Peru based on our five-year experience. Number one, highlighting the relevance of engineering knowledge in the history of science and health. Uh, number two, calling attention to the need to visit and preserve archives and collections that are away from Lima. Three, meeting outside of Lima and promoting work of colleagues who are there as well. Uh, in fact, even though our next workshop, which is in 2025, is going to be virtual and also in person, um, it, most likely it is going to take place outside of Lima. We have very good relations with colleagues who are there, so logistics should be relatively inexpensive. If you're planning on doing any kind of work in Peru, I, I, please let me know and, and consider coming. Um, there is a whole lot more to the country than Lima, of course. And the, the final thing that is on my mind um, about uh, future directions is, is this need to um, find ways to communicate more broadly across Latin American organizations. Um, as I said, Barbara Kirsi was there when this organization was founded, which highlights um, you know, the importance of uh, us communicating. We have a common language as, 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 as an advantage. I also remember I was so struck that Barbara was there and grateful that she could accompany us. It is often easier for Latin Americanists working in this field to go to the US than to travel within our own countries and be there for each other. Um, anyway, it, it, uh, that's uh, one thing that I, I, I want to remark on as a challenge, but also a thing that I would like to see us overcome a little bit more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raul. Uh, and please, everybody, please use the Q&A button to send your, in your questions. Uh, Thomas, I that one of the organizers just remind us of this. Um, and now we're going to, to move. Thank you also for your presentation and for keeping the time. Um, I, I think it's a good idea that we have the three papers together because there are connections uh, between them. Um, so Barbara Kirsi Silva is associate professor at the Interdisciplinary Program College at the Faculty of History, Geography, and Political Science of the Catholic University of Chile. Uh, her research is about history of science and technology in contemporary Latin America in a, with a global perspective. The main topics of her research are the history of astronomy, of solar energy uh, and scientific knowledge production. She's now working on the International Geophysical Year. Barbara, please go ahead, thank you. Thank you, Luisa. I will share my screen. Is it okay? Thank you. Okay, you. thank you, Luisa, and thank you, Raul, for that lovely memory of uh, of the first meeting of uh, the Peruvian Association, and I'm, and I'm always happy to help our, uh, and support other initiatives in, in Latin America. Um, well, um, I wanted to present here a few ideas of, of the future of our, perhaps what is happening on history of science in Chile. Um, History of science in Chile is still a very small field. Uh, I'd like to think it's growing. I don't know how much, but I like to think it's, it's growing. We have an association that is very informal um, that is called the, the Laboratory of History of Science, Technology and Society. Uh, it is informal. I mean, it, it, is, it has not like a, a legal constitution. So uh, therefore we decided not to have a precedent or any formal um, directive board and not to associate it to any university yet. So we have more freedom and less bureaucracy to deal with. And it is a, a very, uh, it is a small uh, association, but very active. We have been working since 2016, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
as Raul mentioned in the Peruvian case, it, it's also a volunteer. I mean, we all do things because we want to and we, because we think history of science is it's important. And we have monthly sessions, uh, some some of them in person, some of them in um, uh, online. Um, one of our best efforts, I think, is uh, we did like a collection of four volumes on the history of science and technology in Chile that it's, I'm happy to say, it's in print. So it's going to be a reality really, really soon. I hope so. Um, and and yeah, and we have been working on that. And we there we have a place to make uh, connections, to have a network, to have colleagues to talk to, because in each university, there are not enough colleagues working in the history of science or any any field related uh, whatsoever. So this this has been the place for us to talk to uh, to each other. Um, oh, I forgot to put the time. OK, um, so when we talk about what was I going to to um, tell you here, it's like, OK, we could talk about the, the lab. We, we call it the, that way, the lab. But it's like, what is there? What people in the lab are doing? or in my opinion, of course, what I think or what I see they are doing and uh, how to deal with this thing of us making or trying to do history of science from the South, that we always have to deal with this huge theme, with this, this huge issue of dealing with the historiography, uh, historiographical tradition of the Northern Hemisphere. We're always relating to that. So perhaps this, these are a few thoughts, less institutional perhaps, more like what we see that is happening in terms of of ideas or or i don't know provocations perhaps that what we could do uh, in the future so we we were talking about this and we remind we uh, recall this poem of uh, a guatemalan poet that is Luis Cardosa y Aragón this is like uh, that who is not in the future does not exist and the future began yesterday and it did this resonates quite a bit in the Latin American ecosystem. And, and I'm thinking, of course, of Latin America, not just Chile uh, by itself. And this uh, simple verse, I think it can is inspire a discussion about the future of history of science in, in Latin America that has some particularities compared to how this future of history of science might, might seem in, uh, in other societies, in other places of the, of the world. Um, and this is where I think, uh, what if we don't start by thinking the history of science, but what if we start by thinking of uh, the future? And um, of course, this painting by Dalí is very famous and it's like a, a, a statement, a very uh, explicit statement that humans make their own time. They produce time. Time is not there objectively, as we know from the theory of, of relativity uh, onwards. Um, and this, inspired uh, a reflection on how we understand and look at the past and um, the future, but mainly what time does Latin America produce? I mean, if humans produce their own, their own time, then what time does Latin America produce? Is it the same one that uh, in some other place in the Northern Hemisphere? And I think perhaps not. Um, so, and I wanted to make a few comments from the history of astronomy, not only because it is my field and I work on that, but also because it has some very cool pictures and, um, <laughs> and beautiful images, but also because uh, astronomy in the Southern Hemisphere is quite a big deal. I mean, it's a very important field of, of science, especially in Chile. It's a, it's a very dynamic, very um, important and very strong field that is, and, and it's um, growing at, an accelerated pace. I mean, it's, it, it has not stopped there. But also because with astronomy happens something very interesting that it observes the stars, the starlight precisely, but we can understand or we can think that astronomy actually what deals with time. When we observe, when we look at the stars, when we observe the, the, the starlight, we are looking at a light emitted thousands of starlight years ago. So we are looking actually at the past. We're not looking at our present. So astronomy has this, this very interesting thing of, of dealing with time and making a convergence between the past, the present and, and the future as it deals with this overwhelming technology uh, that takes us like a step, a step further, further away into the, into the future. And also astronomy, you, you might know, um, 
has a, had in the past a very important uh, role in setting time. I'm thinking, of course, of the Greenwich uh, Mean Time that was set in the late uh, 19th century and then sort of replaced uh, by the UCT in, in, the, in the mid 20th century. And of course, astronomy contributed to the synchronized time, this expert, but, but we know the experience of time is hardly synchronized. And also that brought us to another idea that might be that might be quite quite interesting. So this is the map of the different time zones that that uh, our lovely uh, our um, dear organizers of this event had to deal with. They put into together all the all these uh, different time zones. But also, if you take a look at this map and you took uh, and you look at South America, there, Chile is was supposed to be in the blue stripe in that time zone, but it is in the in a green stripe that actually matches the, the time of New York. And that was a political decision to be closer in time to this world center of, of business. This, this was 1930s approximately. No? So, so be there closer in time to this world center of, of, of business, of dealings, of trade, of, of the modern world, basically. Um, so of course, this relates to in Latin America, science and technology have a long tradition of, of being a of being a very crucial element of moder modernization, a desire, a longing, a project with, with which will come true someday, but it doesn't. <laughs> so um so well. And um this image also relates to this universal time, to the idea of having a, a universal time. And we know, despite making efforts for synchronous time in the 19th century, in the 20th century, and so and so on, um, the experience, as I said, the experience of time is not synchronized. And um, we know, despite all the, those efforts, we, we, we can still synchronize or think we have synchronized like the, the present. We cannot, we cannot predict what is happening in the future. We know that. That might be the job for, I don't know, fortune tellers or, or something like that, but not for historians nor historians of, of science. But whether prediction is impossible, I think from Latin America, it becomes very clear. We still have two very important elements. That is aspirations and anticipations as a way to relating to the to the future. And then, of course, it is very obvious. No, we, we come to our Ardun Apadure. Now, who mentioned this relevance of the capacity of aspirations that I'm not going to, in honor of the time, I'm not going to read the, the quote, it's there, no? But it is important in the sense that um, Latin America has been aspiring for this future, for this science and, and technology that relates to the, to the future, and therefore has lots of this capacity of, uh, to aspire, this capacity of, of aspiration. Um, and we can also see this aspiration as a way of resilience uh, with the present, as a way of escaping and at, at the same time, like making amends with the present, which is not how we imagined it would be. And this gets us to think of expectations. And I think there is an interesting match there that I would want to, to mention briefly. Um, for historians, we have heard so many times the horizon of expectations, right? So many times this, this idea of um, what is uh, we could suppose will happen according to a certain context, and many historians are, have worked on that. But in this sense, I, I was thinking about Abadurai uh, capacity of, of a supplier, and I remember the event horizon that is a, a thing in physics, not the um, horizon of expectations, but the event horizon, horizon then you, you have words playing like a beautiful game there, in, in my opinion. So this event horizon in physics is the last spot. It's the light you see there. This is a simulation, of course. But it's the last spot before uh, in a black hole before um, we don't know what is going to happen. Like it is the last spot we can trust that the law, every law of physics is going to apply is going to to happen and before that uh, sorry after that we don't know so uh it's like a threshold right 
But beyond that verge, we don't know what is going to happen. We can't anticipate anything. We can't anticipate the, the behavior of the bodies, whatever they are. And um, the movement of their components, um, we can anticipate what is going to happen. So we are in complete, uh, completely in uncertainty. Um, but we could anticipate this, this event horizon, this simulation. And when uh, a very um, simultaneous work in different places of the world actually built the event horizon telescope and got the first image of a black hole, we figured out that the simulation was actually very close to the uh, first image, constructed image, of course, of, the, of a black hole. And this was, of course, the event horizon and telescope. So all this to say, perhaps Latin America is a region uh, that could work as a place of expectations in which we can't anticipate, but the thing is we are aspiring, and we have been aspiring for so long for this modernization, science, technology, and everything else that, that could be this place to hold on to expectations in a, in a world that is, has not a very bright future, maybe. Um, okay, and, and in Latin America, perhaps this, this time and space colliding uh, constantly, as the Guatemalan, the Guatemalan uh, poet said, this future began yesterday, um, meaning we have already drawn some of our future already in the path uh, taken. And to end with, I don't know how much time. Okay, I'm okay. And to come to an end, here's a picture of Alma. This is the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, um, which operates through radio astronomy. That's why there are antennas, not an optical uh, telescope. This is located in in Chagnantor, a plateau in the in the Chilean Altiplano, at uh, five thousand meters altitude. Um, that has very unique fe fe uh, features for uh, astronomical observation. This is the work here is, is um, 66 of these antennas, and um, they are connected th uh, through interferometry, so they can work together by themselves or together. I mean, all of them, the 66 or a few of them in different configurations and, and settings, because the antennas are not static, they move. And actually, that movement is called the antenna dance. That is a very uh, beautiful metaphor, I think. Um, so in this, with this antenna dance, it is possible to reach the cold universe. Um, signals that are so weak, it is impossible to get or, or, or almost impossible to get otherwise. So these anten antennas work together to reach to a very distant past, this cold universe, right? Um, and for these antennas to work together, I mean, for this project to come to come true, to come uh, to be a reality, several international parties had had to work together as well. Um, and it was not always easy, of course. Uh, those of us trying to get into science diplomacy know that uh, um, international agreements for science are not always uh, very smooth. Um, and they have, they have, they have of, of course, uh, different interests, need, needs, pressures, ideas. Uh, but Alma is real. This is real. This is uh, happening. It is working and it is producing cutting edge science, taking us perhaps a bit closer to the future while examining this distant past in the cold uh, universe. And time here uh, collides, actually. The desert a host uh, this very un untouchable uh, past, like nothing degrades there. <laughs> Everything remains basically the same and hosts this amazing technology that seems like some alien world, some, some different planet, like uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps Mars or something like that, uh, living in, in, some, in some future. So with all this, like um, what different people are doing here in the history of science, not only astronomy. I, I, I speak from the history of astronomy because it's, it's what I know best. But I think in one way or another, we all have these ideas of, of the past and future and how to deal with this um, issues that are very embedded in, in, in perhaps sub subconsciously in, in our mentalities in, in, Latin, in, in Latin America.
So maybe I remember the other day, like maybe this idea of Chakrabarti that uh, the, this waiting room of, of history is a bit more complex than we thought. And maybe the history of science and technology in the Southern hemisphere could help us understand that, that idea. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you, Barbara. Uh, so I, I thank the three speakers for, for being um, for presenting such inspiring uh, talks, um, giving perspectives uh, um, locally rooted but in dialogue with uh, with um, with other approaches and historiographies. We have got so far any question in the Q and A. I I I do please urge the the participants if you want to to present any questions. You have to write. You have to to click the button Q and A and write your questions there. So um, uh, maybe I'll start um, by by questioning. You have uh, uh, to Thomas maybe um, you were the first presenter and you presented uh, uh, something on the you presented a, a paper on the future of history of science and technology from the French perspective working on Germany. Um, how does this uh, different uh, of being on site in a different uh, setting, in a different uh, cultural and historiographical tradition, how does this inspire you to, to think about your own country and your own um, cultural tradition in a different way? Um, <clears throat> thanks for the um, thanks for the, the question. That's um, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I can answer um, everything. Um, I I would like to say that I was very interested by um, by uh, Howells and and also Barbara's remark that um, you have um, not the same, but you have a similar phenomenon in in America between northern and and southern America. Um, what might be slightly different with the with the Germany and, and French case is um, is first of all that you have this um, tension between um, one country that has a very long tradition and which prides itself of having a long tradition in the history of science and also the sensation at least for the younger generation that things will crystallize at some point at a European level and um and that might be the same for South America maybe or something similar um but you still all always have this, um, this tension, I think, um, that is in, in the methodology, and because you, you see that like basic things that are known in Germany are unknown in, in France and vice versa. So it, it's nice to, to know that no one can know everything. So when, when the teacher says, oh, you've never heard about this person, you're like, yeah, but you probably never heard of some German guy that you should know of. Um, and, um, and on the other end, it also asks the, the, the question of uh, what should be the common culture, like a common European culture in the history of science for the, for the future. And, um, and for that, I don't have any answer except maybe agreeing with what I think Barbara said, that there is always this tension you, you have to take position towards the huge English speaking world and historiography, you, you cannot say, okay, I'm doing without that. On the other hand, if you're trying to do like a European thing or a Southern American thing, you also have to have some specificity. The goal is not to make the same book in English that someone else could have written. Maybe, maybe you want to react to that, Barbara? Yeah. Yeah, no, I wanted to add that that it, it resonated so much what uh, Thomas uh, said about this um, publishing in French. I mean, what, what do we have of history of science in French and what do we have in English? And it's basically the same in, in Spanish, but without the long tradition of anything, right? <laughs> like without a long tradition in history of science, of course, but the this tension of 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 like, yes, I want to publish in Spanish because I, I want the field of history of science to grow in the region, in Latin America or, or whatever Spanish-speaking community. But uh, I have to 
dialogue and to make connections with the English speaking uh, literature because things, ideas are there, are, ha are happening there. So it's a tension and it's not very easy to, to solve, I think. And of course we need literature in, in Spanish because otherwise we, we cannot, I mean, our teaching possibilities are limited. Um, and not, especially undergrad students, they are not very eager to read in English, like, <laughs> or, or not at first. I, so it's a constant tension and, and it resonated with me very much what you presented about uh, the French uh, tradition. And I think Raoul is. Yeah, Raoul, yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Uh, ju just to add that, uh, if, I'm, I'm not sure, Thomas, if you use the term European science, uh, but maybe the term sciences in Europe for the case, I'm, I'm thinking about a paper published in Centaurus, the journal of uh, the history, the European um, Association for the History of Science. Um, there was a, a, a last year, I think, or two years ago, published a special issue with uh, uh, some, some, um, some articles that were chosen like an anthology for the last years, and there is an introduction by Anna Simons and Maria Paula Diogo, and they do talk about this from the I don't know I don't know if you know the group Science and Technology in the European Periphery Step Group, and they do um, go for the sciences in Europe and not European sciences. But Raul, you 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 I'm I'm not sure if this helps to 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 contribute to the dialogue. But Raul, please go ahead. Uh, thanks. Uh, actually, what I was, um, I think this conversation about the kinds of you know, cross national tensions, it matters a great deal. It's, it's really, really important because it speaks to like issues we've had for a long time in the history of science about historiographies and languages in which, you know, most of the history of historiography that we make people read is published in. Um, our experience has uh, brought to the fore the fact that in countries uh, such as Bolivia and Peru, where native languages are very, very vibrant and important, the tradition of history of science needs to acknowledge also um, that there are uh, producers, writers, scholars, and intellectuals who will not care for English and really not even for Spanish, which in countries where the colonizing language, such as Peru and Chile, is Spanish, it matters a great deal. Uh, so systematically, we don't really have yet a good way to include those kinds of conversations and priorities into an organization like the Peruvian Asociación. We want to, we just don't know how. I have, I have a question here, um, not in the Q&A, um, still no questions there but by Sam Robinson, who is one of the organizers. Um, and the question is the following, uh, how, important, um, how important are regional bodies within the history of science and technology and, and medicine? And there was a mention of a Latin American grouping and France operates within the European Society for the History of Science, uh, was also mentioned in Thomas' talk. Um, you have the, the question in, on the chat, uh, if, if you want to read it again. Mm -hmm. Well, I, sorry, I don't so, I, sorry you, you, I, you, you, you don't have it, sorry. No, we don't have it. <laughs> I don't, I don't think, I don't know if I understood correctly, Luisa, but in Latin America, we don't have a regional association. I mean, um, there are things for the history of technology, but like the, Raul, correct me, please, please if, if I'm wrong, but I don't think there is like a Latin American Association of History of Science or, or something uh, like that for technology. There, yes, I, I do know that. I think Raul mentioned something, no? There used to be one. They published Kipu uh, for several yes. years and then it, it, it went away. They kind of snuck out of uh, public presence. There is something for history of uh, medicine. And um, I don't wanna make a political statement um, here, but it, it, it was dominated by practitioners and it's the kind of production and discussions that happened there were very you know, top down. Um, this is what physicians care about. Uh, the history of the you know, 
first medical instrument developed by my great mentor or the history of my subspecialty that I did a fellowship in, which is very fine. Um, but there's a, it could be a little bit more inclusive. Mm. I hope that wasn't political. <laughs> and maybe just show something about, about um, Europe. There is the European Society for the History of, of Science. Um, um, but we are working at the moment to better articulate the, the national level and this European uh, level because um, we do not want to get rid of like saying French or German or Spanish journals because they have a role to, to play uh, for students and for the defense of the language and anyway. Uh, but on the other hand, it's it's quite obvious to work at at a European level. So uh, we, we in France, we took a very uh, simple, concrete uh, step uh, this year. It's like we synchronized our um, our Congress with the European Congress to make sure that it never falls in the same year and that there is always something. So basically, it's um, like uh, even years, it will be the European one and uneven years, it will be the, the, the French one. And this kind of thing is, um, I think, important in, in the long run, it's very important, but in the short run, it's very important for the, for the early career researchers who always have the tension between trying to play the, the country card, staying in the own country and stay there and playing the European card, which is going to make a postdoc, I don't know, prestigious postdoc in, in, in Berlin or London. And, and, um, and if we want to avoid this kind of unhealthy competition, we should make things as smooth as possible while respecting all kind of identities. Uh, well, I, I think uh, Sam rewrote the question and um, he said that basically, uh, if by strengthening the regional bodies, one could strengthen uh, the national uh, learned societies. So that would be a mutual a reciprocal, um, in, I mean, head or, or contribution. Uh, so so it does not, it, it could be in, in terms of cooperation, or as you said, for instance, for early career scholars, it is quite important, I think, to be able to be supported for the national learned societies to, to, to go and, and present and also for, for the international to, to be aware, at least at a regional level, to, to know, um, to, to also to not to downplay the, the national, what, what do you think about this? Not to downplay the national historiography, but to be able to, to look at the national historiographies people are working on from a transnational perspective. We have uh, two minutes left in the session. Please, I actually was to curious. Can I bring you into this conversation? I'm, I'm very curious about what you think, you know, from a Portuguese perspective about these tensions that Tomas and Barbara and I have been discussing, you know, between local organizations, larger organizations, looking inside our own nations. What does it look like in Portugal? Well, in Portugal, the history of science, technology and medicine is also a, a small field. Uh, but for, for you to have an idea, we have uh, an effort to, uh, um, to we, we, we were members of, of the Tensions of Europe Network, History of Technology in Europe, and uh, we are members and also of the STEP, Science and Technology in the European Periphery. So I think we're going both ways. Uh, and and uh, we, we there is historiography in Portugal that talks about this peripheral, which is contested, this peripheral category, because at the same time as, as the Spanish, the... the, the Portugal used to be a metropole of an empire, so there is this double um, condition uh, in history. Um, and uh, what I can tell you is that, for instance, my research center, which is the one that is dedicated to this field, um, it publishes an online open access journal, but in English. So this is a choice to help the 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 the. the to help internationalize the scholarly community here. So there is this tension, but well, I it's I have to give you back the floor and, and, and we have to close the session. So please let me know what else do you want to to say before we, we end this session? 
And thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love Barbara's photos about the desert in Chile. So cool. Oh, they are always so so cool. <laughs> okay. So we are now ending the session, thanking uh, the technical support and the organizers. And I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.